Um, as committee chair, I'd like to thank all of our partner organizations that make the festival possible every year. The Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, which if you didn't hear, got a new name in 2020. They used to be Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, and now they're the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. Um, the Virginia State Parks, Back Bay National Wildlife Refuge, the Virginia Aquarium, the Virginia Beach Public Library, Lynn Haven River Now, and the Virginia Beach Audubon Society, who graciously helped bring our keynote to you today. Um, but before I introduce our keynote, I do have an announcement I'd like to make. Um, last year, as many of you know, in honor of the 10th anniversary of the festival, we created a Wildlife Advocate Award and named it in Mary Reed Barrow's honor for her lifelong dedication to celebrating, advocating, and educating people about wildlife. This year, we saw nominations from the community to award this honor to the first recipient. We received several nominations that the committee reviewed until we found the individual we felt most exemplified these qualities. This individual was actually nominated by two different people who did not know each other, but expressed similar sentiments about their nominee. This year's recipient is a valued member of the wildlife rehab community who continuously goes above and beyond to help injured animals in need. Her dedication seemingly knows no bounds, and she is always willing to answer the calls of concerned citizens. To keep up with demands, she has been instrumental in establishing a network of others like herself to share the heavy load of caring for these animals. In addition, she tirelessly works to raise funds to support these efforts and finds creative ways to educate the greater community through social media, outreach, training, and workshops. I was lucky enough to surprise her on Wednesday at her place of employment. Yes, she has a job. This is only her volunteer work I'm talking about, along with the two individuals who nominated her. And tonight I am pleased to announce that Meredith Broadhurst is the 2021 recipient of the Mary Reed Barrow Wildlife Advocate Award. So Chon is gonna share a picture of that moment. Look at that, isn't that? pandemic fun for you. Way to go, Meredith. Your hard work does not go unnoticed, and we appreciate your continued efforts on behalf of wildlife. So yay, Meredith, congratulations. <laughs> she was so surprised. <laughs> I don't think she knew what we were doing <laughs> when we showed up at her work. It was pretty fun. Um, but now, without further ado, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this year's keynote speaker. Armar Ayash um, is both an expert on gull identification and an evangelist for gull recreation. He hosts several popular websites devoted to gulling, has published various technical articles on gull ID, molt, and range shifts, serves as the board of directors of the Illinois Ornithological Society, and coordinates the annual gull frolic. Amar is a well-known speaker and blogger and can usually be found at birding events and festivals throughout the continent. He lives in Northern Illinois and does most, most of his goal watching in the Lake Michigan region, which I got to witness firsthand when we were having a meeting about this. He was goal watching while we were having the meeting. It was, it was multitasking at its finest. Besides supplementing the need to ramble about this fascinating family of birds, his primary objective in maintaining his blog, anythinglaris.com, is to advance gull recreation in North America. And tonight, we're excited to hear his thoughts on the often complicated love-hate relationship between man and gull. And Amar's been working virtually, so he is a Zoom, <laughs> he's very familiar with Zoom, so we're happy to have him. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Amar. So welcome, Amar. Thank you. Um, thank you, Katie. I hope everybody can hear me on your end. I am very excited to be talking about gulls and man or man and gulls, depending on your perspective. Uh, this is my third talk today, but it's my first talk on man and gull. Um, I gave two identification talks this morning, one for the Florida Space Coast Festival and one for one of the uh, Iowa Audubon groups. And they were uh, technical um, ID talks um, that I that um, I needed to uh, kind of back away from and, and take a chill pill and talk about something a little more lighthearted. 
I hope you guys um, will find some value to this talk. What could this possibly be about? Talking about um, seagulls. Um, gulls are definitely a cosmopolitan group of birds. Uh, they're found in a variety of landscapes. Um, some of them are among the most coveted bird species in the world. And when I tell my friends and, and family members that, um, they, they sort of shrug and don't believe that there are people that spend thousands of dollars to go up to the Arctic and see some of the rarer gull species, um, but they are. Some of them live in um, distant, remote, merciless regions. And um, some of them live right around the corner from you in your most uh, immediate surroundings. So I'm going to be talking about some of the ways uh, gulls have learned to adapt and learn to uh, benefit from man's doings. Uh, you can see in the cover slide here some representations of that. Um, but before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about their taxonomy. Um, there's typically 50, 54 gull species, depending on the taxonomy that you read. Uh, in North America, we have 28 gull species that have been seen. They're divided among 11 genera. Those are the genera there on the uh, table that I have. The biggest genus is Laris. Laris are most of the gulls you typically encounter on your local beaches. Um, there's about 25 species in the Laris genus. These others that have asterisks here, these are single species units. So Craigris, for instance, is a swallow-tailed gull. There's only one species in that genus. Uh, Zima is a uh, Sabin's gull. Again, only one species in that genus. What you're seeing on the uh, screen here, the big blackback there is a great blackback gull. That's the largest gull species in the world. And next to it is an adult little gull. That's what it's called. It's the smallest gull species in the world. Little gull is about the size of an American robin. And these two were once placed in the same genus uh, up until about 10 years ago when ornithologists finally decided they're, they're different enough to where if we keep them in the same genus, it really does conceal some of the uh, diversity that's found in gulls. Uh, great blackback is pretty common on the coastline. You've probably seen them on the coastlines. Um, really long wingspan. That's a great blackback gull there with a bald eagle. Um, they have about a five foot, five and a half foot wingspan. Again, the largest gull species on the planet. Um, is there diversity among the gulls? I think so. I showed this on the uh, Wildlife Festival Facebook group. Um, this is a collage of 15 different species. They're all adults. Um, we have five different genera represented in this collage here. And uh, I hope you can appreciate some of the differences in bill colors, some of the differences in bill shapes, uh, head patterns, uh, whether the eye has a, a red orbital ring around it or pink. Uh, if you're attending my identification talk tomorrow, you'll see uh, a lot more of this where we get into the nitty gritty of identification. This talk is not going to be so much ID based. It's going to be a lot more um, just speaking about gulls and their ecology and uh, how in some ways uh, we've made them part of our experience. Gulls can be thought of as three broad classes. There's two-year gulls, three-year gulls, and four-year gulls. Um, and what this means basically is that's the amount of years it takes for them to acquire adult plumage. Um, so something like a herring gull takes about three and a half to four years to become sexually mature, to be uh, experienced enough to maintain a territory, to find a partner, to, to build a nest and incubate and take on adult responsibilities. Um, if you're not familiar with some of these um, acronyms, GBBG is Great Blackback Gull and LBBG is Lesser Blackback Gull. Um, another way to think of gulls besides just categorizing them into two-year, three-year, four-year gulls is um, there's generally two broad groupings. The small turn-like gulls, which you're seeing here is a first cycle Bonaparte gull. So this bird is under a year old it has this distinctive black trailing edge on the wing. Um, but 
some of those other small turn light -like gulls, those are the ones I would mention earlier being uh, among the most coveted bird species in the world. Maybe you recognize some of these characters. Um, Ken Kaufman once said, if these four species had voices that were any better, he wouldn't need any other birds to look at. And they are really so cartoonish in appearance. Um, and I think one of the things that makes them so alluring is that they're rare and um, they live in these very remote regions where they're hard to see. So we like species that are rare, right? They tend to be more special in our eyes. Um, Sabin's gull or Sabine's gull there with the yellow tip on the bill. This is the one you're probably most likely to see um, um, on a pelagic trip offshore. Uh, we see them annually. September is a great month to see them along the eastern seaboard. Uh, little gull is another one that you're likely to see. But Rosses and ivory gull, these are Arctic breeding species. They are really difficult to see. I know people who've been birding for 30, 40 years and have never seen a Rosses or ivory gull. Um, so very, very rare species, high on the list of people's uh, want to see birds. Back to this Sabin's gull. This is the open wing on an adult Sabin's gull. It's in breeding plumage. Uh, one of the most stunning geometries of any seabird alive. These are stunning birds. They're hard to confuse with anything else. They have these forked tails, um, uh, these triangles on the back of black, gray, and white. Um, but Sabin's gull is really not too big of a species. It's about the size of a Bonaparte skull. Um, I would say about one and a half times the size of a robin. Okay, so not too big of a species. Something fascinating that we just recently learned about Sabin's gull, um, they're trans-equatorial migrants. So they cross the equator all the way from the Arctic where they breed. And um, there was a recent study, this map actually comes from that study where they found um, a male female pair that were fitted with geo trackers. They put GPS trackers on their backs and they find these birds migrating uh, down different pathways. So you have the male that went down the Pacific Ocean in red here, and the female that went down the Atlantic Ocean down to South Africa. So this was the first documented case of male-female pairing taking divergent migratory pathways. And that's not even the fascinating part. The fascinating part is these birds migrated back north the following breeding season. They regrouped and nested just feet away from where they were tagged the previous summer. It's a male female Sabin's gull. Um, they nest in the Arctic, um, in the high tundra. Um, but again, they migrate through the interior off our coasts and they end up in places like uh, Chile and Namibia and South Africa, one of the longest migrants uh, of all seabirds. So that's the fun stuff. Let's get into the heavier gulls, the typical seagull, if you will. These are the large white-headed gulls. That's the second grouping. And this is what most people are ordinarily going to think of when, when you say seagull or gull. And by the way, I don't have a problem with the word seagull. Um, I think it's part of our language. Everybody understands it. Uh, I don't rebuke people for using the word seagull. Um, I prefer the word gull, but um, Seagull is just fine. These are large white-headed gulls, yellow bills, gray backs. This is what most people have uh, as a mental image when you say gull. And they're the ones that tend to provide birders with the most uh, headaches and nightmares because their identification is, is challenging at times. Um, they're very, very good at surviving along the buffer zone. Um, the buffer zone is essentially the coastline right? Um, they're very, very good at going out to sea when the land isn't offering anything. And they're very, very good to coming uh, inland when the sea is being unkind. So they work this buffer zone on the coastline. This is a herring gull here. Herring gulls have pale eyes as adults. They have yellow bills and pale gray backs. Um, but then there's also the black backs. These black backs are part of the large white-headed gulls. The bigger one on the left there with pink legs is a great blackback gull. And its smaller cousin there with yellow legs is the lesser blackback gull. 
Um, to give you an idea of some of the differences in flight, um, you would surely know if you were looking at a large white-headed gull versus a small turn-like gull. Um, I'm not going to assume everybody knows what these species are, so I'll just mention it. The one on the right here is a Bonaparte's, has kind of this uh, pointy, small black bill, a white wedge on the leading edge of the wing. This bigger one here is a ring-billed gull. Uh, ring-billed gulls have this bold black ring on their bills or on their beaks, and they also have yellow legs. So that's a nice size comparison. Uh, Ring-billed gull is a medium-sized gull. They're not as large as herrings and lesser blackbacks and Icelands, um, but they're also bigger than most of the small turn-like gulls. Um, in the large white-headed gulls, there's immense size variation that I think enough birders don't appreciate. Um, males tend to be 15 to 30 percent larger than their female counterparts. Um, so I think you can guess from this slide here which one is male and which one is female. Um, this is really neat to watch in the spring when they start pairing up and kind of isolating themselves on the beach. You can see um, in April, May, uh, and probably guess correctly every time which one is male and which one is female. Among these large white-headed gulls, there's uh, a bit of a hybridization problem. They tend to easily fall in love with one another without bounds. Uh, it's not so much an issue uh, in the eastern part of the continent, but it is a huge issue um, in Western North America from Alaska all the way down to Oregon. Um, there's hybrid zones out west where the hybrids literally outnumber their pure parent species. Places like Oregon and Washington and British Columbia have um, these large swaths of hybrid zones where there are thousands and thousands of hybrids that interbreed one generation after the next. And so um, it becomes a little bit fuzzy when you think about what is the definition of a species? And if these species are interbreeding so much, um, are we possibly witnessing speciation in the making? Um, and, and that's something I always ask myself when I go out west and look at things like glaucus wing western hybrids and um, glaucus wing herring hybrids. Um, I come back home more confused uh, than ever when looking at these hybrids. Uh, feeding patterns, they're definitely predators. Um, not only are they scavengers, this is a first year ring build gull on Lake Michigan with a uh, warbler. I'm not sure what type of warbler it is, but the gulls in migration, they know that these songbirds come in off the lake exhausted. They fly out and they catch them um, several hundred feet before they get to land. And um, they seem to just do it for sport sometimes. Um, I don't know if I'm selling gulls or I'm, I'm actually bad mouthing them, but this is what gulls do. They, they find, um, anything they can put their bill on, and it's game over. Uh, this great black back gull here has grabbed a rabbit, and um, you would be surprised. This rabbit can be swallowed whole. Um, that's right. I'm going to show you a short video clip. Uh, we're going to get right to the climax here, if you will. Increase the competition. And with chicks on the way. The stakes are high for gulls to sustain themselves and their nesting partners. It is a little gruesome. With rising tension, it's not uncommon to see stubborn gulls battling for a helpless prize. And for those who are successful, a delicious meal is their reward, which rather alarmingly can be gulped down and swallowed whole. So not to outdo Marley, who posted a photo recently, just a little while ago on Facebook with a great black bat gull that had gulped down an entire fish. 
Um, they do regurgitate the bones and the fur later on. Uh, sometimes if you look at their roosts, you'll find a lot of bones and fur um, after they've, they've digested uh, what they want. So if, if gulls are predators, what are the predators of gulls? Um, number one predator for gulls would be peregrine falcon, without question, hands down. Um, and then a second one would be bald eagles. Um, bald eagles seem to do it more when they're, when they're desperate and starving, um, but peregrines seem to do it on a regular basis. What you're seeing in this slide is a peregrine falcon flying away with the Bonaparte skull. There it is in its talons. And the herring gull in the back there isn't happy with this. They're letting the peregrine know um, you've disrupted the order here. This was taken also on Lake Michigan where um, I've probably seen it close to a dozen times where a peregrine will come in and, and snatch a gull. Um, it's quite common actually, and it's amazing to watch the gull's behavior when a peregrine falcon comes in. Um, it's it's um, a response like I've never seen with gulls, um, an urgent response. They all kind of in unison dart out over the water and, and, and try to evade the peregrine falcons. It's a lot easier to dodge bald eagles. Bald eagles tend to be slower, not as nimble, um, and they can get away from the eagles. Uh, most times they don't even uh, fly away um, when the bald eagles come through. But here's a bald eagle taking um, a California gull. Okay. Um, a lot of people, I think, when they see things like this um, become referees. And me personally, I don't take sides when I see things like this, but I see posts on Facebook all the time where people definitely take sides and they might root for the eagle and uh, feel okay with the gull being taken. Um, but then the slide I showed with the gull taking the warbler, I've shown this in a few talks where I've gotten a lot of grunts and people upset with the fact that I would show something like this, um, but this is nature. And uh, if you observe it enough, you'll see these things on a regular basis. Gulls are also kleptoparasites. Um, that's just another word for pirates. Um, they are very good at chasing other birds and making them regurgitate their food. What you're seeing on the left here, this brown bird is a first cycle Hearman's gull. Hearman's gull is endemic to Mexico, uh, primarily Baja region. Uh, there's a small colony of Hearman's gulls that nest in uh, Seaside, California. I took this photo in San Francisco. Uh, there was a family throwing bread and popcorn at the birds. This common raven came in, grabbed a piece of bread, and um, the Hearman's wasn't having it. Um, what's interesting is that there was enough food for every one of those birds to eat probably two times, three times over, um, but it's just the way they're wired. This species uh, would rather chase another bird and steal its food and, than, than pick up its own morsel. It's very fascinating behavior to watch, um, especially when you see that there's enough food to go around, um, but yet they decide to pursue and harass other birds. Uh, impressive is how big this raven is compared to the gull. And um, it eventually did get that piece of bread. Here's a glaucus gull. This is our second largest gull species in the world. This glaucus gull uh, has taken a cackling goose egg. Um, that's a big egg. And glaucus gulls tend to shift about 60, 70% of their diet is eggs in the breeding season. They steal each other's eggs. They steal other seabird eggs, goose eggs, duck eggs. This was taken in uh, Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. Gulls are also fruit eaters and seed eaters. Um, I've seen them eat everything from date palm, um, as you're seeing here in this photo. This was in the Salton Sea region in California. Uh, I've seen them eat crab apples, Russian olive, uh, you name it. Um, they also eat seeds. They'll come to your feeder if, um, if they're desperate enough. They're insectivores. This is a Franklin's gull uh, hawking insects. If you've ever been to the Great Salt Lake in the summer and fall season, you know there's lots of brine flies. Millions, if not billions of brine flies. These are California gulls. 
Um, they don't have to do anything at these hatchings. They just loaf there all day and take in these flies. They're snapping their bills and just catching hundreds and hundreds of uh, brine flies on a daily, daily basis. Um, it's not just California gulls that take advantage of this. There's thousands of other birds that stage here, lots of shorebirds. Um, it is a pretty spectacular event. If you ever get to the southern part of the Great Salt Lake in the summer and, and early fall, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, some of you already know about the tap dancing. Gulls are really, really good at dancing. I'm gonna show you this interesting feeding behavior. So what they're doing is trying to stir up anything that's in the substrate. They're tapping and tapping and tapping and um, things come up. Worms, different insects. It's a herring gull, pink legs, pale gray back, pale eye. That's a mew gull. It's a little bit smaller than ring-billed gulls, medium-sized gull. So they go out to the fields uh, after a good rain and they'll do this and um, this is part of their diet. They'll feed on insects and worms. Um, when you see them out in these ag fields and these grasslands, um, that's generally what they're doing. And in the back there is a black-headed gull. So um, maybe a good time to shift our attention to how have they benefited from our practices because they seem to do just fine on their own. Um, you saw numerous examples where gulls are able to eke out a living, um, but why is it uh, that we find them so um, gregariously in our urban settings? Um, well, for one, I think fisheries is a big one. Um, this is what kind of pulls them in to land from, from sea. These um, piscivores, if you will, have found ways to definitely capitalize on the way we fish. And I'm not talking about taking the kids out for a fishing trip on the weekend and throwing a fish back for them. I'm talking about these large fishing vessels and trawlers that go out and bring in thousands and thousands of pounds of fish. Um, the gulls know that if they follow this ship long enough, once those nets come up, there's going to be a lot of stuff that falls over. And um, they also know there's going to be bycatch that gets thrown over. Uh, bycatch, if you're not familiar with the term, um, bycatch pretty much is anything that was caught unintendedly. Um, these could be species of low value, something of no demand. Uh, maybe it's the right species, but the wrong size. So these fisheries will literally throw this overboard uh, as they get closer and closer to land and, and once they start to clean up their machinery and equipment and uh, the gulls make a living out of it. And uh, these vessels have kind of carved these highways on the ocean and the gulls follow their wakes. They follow them out and they follow them in and uh, they certainly have made it uh, a part of their ecology. Right. And I think they've benefited tremendously from our fishing, not just offshore, but inshore as well. If you go to some of these fishing ports and fishing towns, um, the gulls have set up colonies adjacent to these towns because, um, well, they know there's lots of fish to be found. Uh, not so much the way we fish, but our lock and dam systems along our riverways. Um, we've essentially created these barriers for fish where they're all concentrated and funneled into one region and the gulls wait for the uh, big hatches and they wait for the spawns and, and they know they're going to find fish here. They're very nimble, they're very quick at finding them. And it's not just the gulls, again, there are other fish eaters here. There are pelicans and eagles and herons and cormorants, um, but the gulls seem to be the most skilled at it. 
Uh, this photo doesn't really do what I'm talking about much justice. This is along the Mississippi River. Uh, when this river freezes over in the winter, right around this time of year, um, there could be 10, 15,000 gulls congregating at one of these locks and dam uh, um, stops here. Uh, not so much, again, uh, to do with our fisheries. This is more isolated to the natives up north. Um, the annual bowhead whale harvest takes place all along coastal Alaska. Um, if you're familiar with Barrow, Barrow is the northernmost town in the United States, way at the top of Alaska there in the North Slope. Um, there's the annual bowhead whale harvest. The Eskimos go out and bring these whales in. Uh, these are huge whales, as you can see in the uh, slide here. Just to give you a little sense of scale, there's a polar bear with a bowhead whale. So uh, come late summer, early fall, they start to bring in the whales and they do this with power boats and pulleys and forklifts. It's really extraordinary to see, uh, to see people not bringing in a fish or even a shark, but a whale of that size. Um, they pass out the portions to the village people. Um, you know, the name of the game is survival. By winter, everything is completely frozen and locked in. And um, the, the bowhead whale sustains them through the winter. So how does this relate to gulls in any way? Well, there's blubber and bones and lots of parts that get left behind that aren't favored by the natives. And the gulls are there to consume it. And these are glaucous gulls that you're seeing. Um, all white wings, no pigment on the wing. These are Arctic circumpolar breeding species. You can find them in Siberia, in Northern Europe, in Greenland, all around the um, Arctic. And um, for glaucous gulls to be held here for months on end, feeding on these carcasses, I think is pretty significant. I think it's become part of their ecology. I, I believe it's a learned behavior. I'm sure the adults await this um, every winter and it can hold them for months. Um, the polar bears have also learned to come visit the bowhead whale carcasses as more and more ice is melting in the Arctic. Um, they're becoming uncomfortably close to the natives in Barrow. Um, this is an article that was published recently where they're walking um, among the natives in the middle of the downtown area, if there is such a thing in Barrow. Um, so this is kind of scary, you know, for polar bears to be walking among the natives there uh, is, is really telling and kind of alarming. Agriculture, the way we farm, uh, not just in this country, but worldwide, it's no secret that the way we farm has pretty much shrunk every type of bird habitat you can think of, grasslands, wetlands, um, but the gulls amazingly have found ways to benefit from this. And this is mainly um, because of the man-made lakes that we've established. These inland reservoirs serve as huge oases for these gulls. What they do is they, uh, they roost on the lakes overnight and then come morning, they're out there with the farmers, they're following the plow in the spring, um, they're there for the fall harvest. These are Franklin's gulls that you're seeing. Franklin's gulls are also trans-equatorial migrants. They nest in the prairie provinces, um, but over the last 50 to 60 years, their breeding range has been shifting farther and farther south. Ornithologists think that the gulls have figured out they don't need to go all the way to northern or central Alberta or Saskatchewan. Their biggest breeding colony is now in South Dakota. There's a small lake in South Dakota that holds half a million Franklin's gulls in one colony, as close as um, 20 million Sabin's gulls are believed to be um, anywhere between uh, the prairie provinces and the Great Plains. Um, so farming, definitely them being the insectivores that they are, they also eat rodents. They're out there um, um, making a great living on the way we farm. 
But if you ask me, what's the single most um, influential way we've impacted gulls in the last hundred years, I would say by far it would have to be landfills, our open landfills. Um, I do want to start by saying if you've never toured a landfill, uh, you definitely have to. I think it'll change your perspective on what you eat and how you recycle and uh, what you dispose of. It is really an eye-opening experience. Um, I visit three or four landfills annually. Um, I do surveys at landfills. I lead field trips in landfills. Uh, this is me at the Space Coast Birding Festival in Florida. A very nice people down there. They invite you into their landfill as long as you stay out of their way. Um, but um, on a serious note, if, if you um, have ever seen a landfill, say a, a time-lapse video of a landfill over a period of 20 to 25 years, and you see how much land is filled literally in, in just a couple decades, it's, it's kind of scary and sad at the same time. Um, so, um, food waste is by far the most, um, single largest source of waste that's found in these landfills. Okay. Let me say that again. Food waste is by far the single largest source of waste that's found in these landfills. Uh, it's estimated in 19, where is this estimate here? In 2019, uh, the EPA estimated 34 million tons of food waste was put into American landfills. 34 million tons of food waste was put into American landfills. I like to tell the story of a landfill that's down in Brownsville, Texas. Brownsville is in the uh, Rio Grande Valley, as far south as you can go in Texas along the uh, Gulf of Mexico. There's a landfill down there that lots of birders go to. Maybe you know of this landfill. They go there to see this special Mexican crow and uh, lots and lots of gulls in the landfill. The landfill collects waste from the uh, local Texan cities there. There's also a landfill across the border in Mexico that collects waste from the uh, local Mexican towns. And uh, if you look this up on eBird, uh, the amount of gulls found in the American landfill is about 20 times the amount of gulls found in the Mexican landfill. So uh, for every, say, one herring gull in the Mexican landfill, you might find 20 in the landfill found in Texas. So that's telling. I think it shows uh, we might be throwing away a bit more food than our neighbors to the south. Lots of people, when they think of gulls, they have this kind of uh, picturesque scene uh, at the beach and taking photo ops with the gulls, white wings, just beautiful birds, majestic birds. Um, but after you've visited a landfill, your perspective becomes this. Um, these are great blackback gulls and herring gulls feeding at a landfill in Vermont. Um, this was a surprise here. This is my friend, George Armistead. This is a landfill that we were at in um, north of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. You got a little surprise there on his vest and his cheek. Um, that's me again, leading a field trip at a landfill. Have I sold landfills yet? <laughs> so um, I'm gonna show you a short video in just a second here of gulls feeding at landfills. Um, it is folks, a, a constant food supply. And you have to give it to the gulls. They're intelligent creatures that have found ways to capitalize on this. Um, and uh, here's a short video of some of this feeding behavior.
Uh, so a lot of towns and municipalities have uh, rules about how we dispose of things at landfills. Um, the rule in most states is that the trash has to be buried uh, before the end of the day's operations. And that's what you were seeing there. They cover the trash after crushing it with a couple of inches of soil and, and mulch. Um, deterring gulls, I, I think, is impossible as long as there is a food source. Um, you might say this is similar to mice in, in indoor buildings. I think it's much, much more difficult, much more extreme. Um, some of the things that we've tried, people are using flare guns. These employees come out to fire off uh, some flares a couple times a day. The gulls will leave temporarily and then they're right back. Um, egg oiling, if you're familiar with this, um, egg oiling is when you take the egg and rub it in corn oil. Uh, sometimes they'll dip the egg in corn oil and they put it back in the nest. And remarkably, um, the adults don't abandon the nest. They continue to incubate the eggs. Um, no oxygen can penetrate the shell of the egg. And so the egg just um, is no good. And they continue to incubate for weeks and eventually abandon the nest. Um, there was a colony of ring-billed gulls here in Chicago um, that was some, I think, 30,000 birds. Uh, and they spent weeks oiling their eggs. And they thought they had eradicated the colony. And those birds came back the following year and nested again. These birds are nesting on a rooftop here in Chicago. Um, some extreme measures is nest removal. Uh, they hire professionals that come out with permits and they literally just pick up the nests, put them in bags and toss them. And what they're trying to do is ban some of these birds and tag some of these birds to see how they respond. If you remove a nest, does that bird come back the following breeding season and set up shop again? Um, do they go to one of the adjacent colonies? Do they just completely abandon the area? So there are studies being conducted on this. Um, but again, you know, if, if you have a place like this, this is Navy Pier in downtown Chicago. Um, hundreds of tourists, thousands of tourists here dropping French fries, um, giving the gulls handouts. And so there's really no way to stop this as long as there's food. Uh, you have a water source, you have some shelter, and um, it's, it's pretty difficult to stop the gulls. Um, one thing um, some local villages are trying is uh, chasers or dogs, if you will. Uh, these companies come out, they're contracted through the city, they, they charge five, six hundred dollars a day. And their job is to just have their dogs run up and down the beach and chase the gulls off. Um, again, it's, it's effective only for a few hours. And as soon as the gulls or as soon as the dogs leave, the gulls come back. Um, so the gulls are pretty used to dogs. People bring their dogs to the beaches all the time, off leash. Um, it's not a very effective method. More effective um, is hiring a falconer. Um, so these folks are a little more expensive. They come at about $2,000 a day. Um, the um, County of Cape May in New Jersey is really big on this. They have a budget set aside just for falconers. Uh, and they hire these folks for the entire summer. Um, some of them, like I said, charging $2,000 to $2,500 a day on some of the busier holidays. Basically, um, the falcon comes through and the gulls um, leave in earnest. Um, they don't come back. They don't come back for some time. Uh, when I say some time, it could be days before they return to that beach. Um, so, you know, is, is this ethical? I think it's much better than shooting them. That's the last resort. There are towns that hire snipers. Um, sharpshooters come in, they'll kill 50 gulls, they'll leave the carcasses there for the other gulls to see. And that's their way of eradicating the gull problem. All of this, um, you know, has an underlying cause, as I mentioned, it's food, right? But that's not the only reason why gulls flock to Homo sapiens. Um, beside food, they take shelter in us. Um, gulls, I think, have figured out that when they're near humans, for the most part, we're not a direct threat to them. Um, and typically, a falcon or um, some other mammalian predator 
won't approach them when they're near humans. And I'm gonna show you a couple slides of this in just a minute. It's pretty fascinating. I've seen gulls actually flock towards people when raptors have flown over. Um, so I do believe there's this, this Pavilonian effect. They feel, um, okay, I got this figured out. If I go near these folks, um, you know, the coyote won't come any closer. Um, and I really believe they've learned this. I, I believe they take shelter and they're afforded some type of protection when they're near people. A question I often get asked, um, are they abandoning the sea? And uh, the correct response is maybe they were never out at sea. I think that's the wrong understanding to have of quote unquote seagulls. Um, gulls are facultative seabirds, right? They are seabirds, but they're facultative. They don't have to be out at sea to survive. They can work both ends of the planet, water and land. Um, the only gulls that are obligate seabirds are the kittiwakes. Um, the kittiwakes, we have two of those, black-legged kittiwake and red-legged kittiwake. Black-legged kittiwake is the most abundant gull species in the world. Um, red-legged kittiwake is endemic to the Bering Sea. These birds nest on islands, they nest on cliffs. They're very hard to reach birds and they survive on the ocean. Um, if you see a kittiwake inland, it's probably not doing too well. Um, interestingly, recently, these cliff nesters, they, 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 they nest on these very narrow cliffs. They're starting to come near man-made structures. This was taken in Seward, Alaska. And I think it's fascinating that they're using this little ledge here with their backs to the sea, facing the rock, kind of like uh, the cliffs. This photo was taken uh, in Homer, Alaska, at the ferry terminal. Um, they're using these man-made structures for the first time in history. And um, I think part of the reason is they're afforded, again, some protection because kittiwakes don't take handouts. They're not feeding on our French fries or our bread. Um, they're there, I think, um, primarily because the bald eagle population has exploded in their natural habitats. So they're coming closer and closer to man now. So the bald eagles have rebounded and now the gulls have shifted some of their ranges and they've moved to places where um, there's more homo sapiens. This is a beach in Daytona sh uh, Shores, Florida. Um, the largest gull concentration you can find anywhere in North America in the winter. There can be up to 100,000 gulls on this beach uh, daily. If you go there now, late January, um, right before sunset, these birds come back to this beach every single night in the winter. They stage here for a few hours and then they all get up and fly out to shore uh, to rest and roost overnight. Now, these gulls, when they're here in the winter, they're here feeding primarily on landfills. They're not feeding at sea. Um, they're not in lakes and rivers. For the most part, 90% of their winter diet is associated with landfills. Um, so you have to give them credit, they're pretty bold. Uh, a birding mentor friend of mine used to say, we've enabled them, maybe we have. Uh, we've made it so easy for them to rest on our shores. We have these piers and break walls and marinas. Um, it's kind of awkward when you're a bird watcher and you like to watch gulls in the summer, especially if a rare one shows up um, at, a, at a popular beach. This is Coney Island in New York. Uh, there was a gray-headed gull that showed up about 10 years ago and um, birders showed up with their cameras and binoculars while people are sunbathing. It's just a really awkward situation, but um, we got the gull. Uh, it was there taking handouts. And uh, I like to tell this story mainly because um, people associate gull watching with winter. It's something you do as a pastime in winter. Um, but there are some gull nuts that watch gulls year round in the summer. It's a little bit tougher to do in the summer. The gulls look a little more scraggly, but um, I think if, if you're going to take on gulls and start watching gulls, you should definitely start in the summer when the juveniles start to show up in June, July, uh, and you'll start to gain an appreciation for what they start as, that beginning plumage, and how they morph into these gray-backed and black-backed adults. So uh, I'm getting close to my time. 
And uh, I think I'm going to stop in just a moment here with this closing. Um, I truly believe gulls are an evolutionary success story, uh, like it or not. I think, um, you know, the fact that no gull species is known to have gone extinct for as long as modern taxonomy has kept records, that's quite telling. And I want to leave you with this challenge. My challenge is, is there another group of birds that you can think of that is as equally at home on land, in the air, and on water? Is there another group of birds that is so diverse, so opportunistic as gulls? Birds that can be found hundreds of miles offshore, birds that can be found in spruce trees, ag fields, landfills, beaches, deserts, mountainous regions. Um, they really are skilled at surviving. And in some ways, they entertain many, many, many people. Um, but above entertainment, I think they connect your average person with nature. I mean, I think gulls can really be a gateway bird for lots of people who may not go out and, you know, purposefully look at nature. I think this is a way for some folks to connect with nature and to get into birds. Um, they're your common person seabird. They're the all-purpose seabird, if you will, uh, from your local Wendy's parking lot to your city parks and beachfronts. Um, they've made us part of their ecology, and I feel kind of honored. So I hope the next time that you encounter a gull flock, um, that that gull flock will fall in favor with you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Amar. We've got some questions. Are you ready for some questions? I absolutely am. Okay, awesome. Well, we've been taking some notes here. So some of these go back to the beginning. So I'm just going to ask them to you in the order they were asked. So, oh, good. Everyone's loving it. Okay. So the first question we had from Janice was, um, what is the difference between a gull and a tern? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that was actually in my ID talk this morning. Um, so terns are gulls closest relatives. Uh, without question, they are their closest relatives. They're their cousins, if you will. Uh, terns tend to be shorter legged. They have forked tails for the most part. Uh, their wings are a lot more narrow and pointed. And um, there are no four year terns or three year terns. Most of them become adult uh, in, in a year and a half. Thank you. All right, Diana asks, why is the hybridization more common in the Western United States? Um, that I don't actually have an answer to. Um, um, it's believed that there's um, species that have um, come back into contact after centuries and millennia species that were once one species and now have um, made contact again. And so whether you know it, this, this happens in the East at some point, I'm not sure. Um, but that, that's a really good question that I don't think I have a good answer to. Why are there more hybrids in the West? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Oh, can I, can I just, I'm yes, sorry to interrupt do it, you, you got it. it. It, in general, folks, there's more variation in bird species in the western half of the continent, right? So you think of the sparrows and you think about the other songbirds and owls, there tends to be uh, more hybridization in general uh, with other bird groups out west, and there's more variation with western species in general. So um, if there's an answer to this, it could probably answer why there's more gull hybrids in the west. All right, Jan has asked, when you were saying that they spend time at sea, um, what were they doing out there? What are the gulls doing out there when they're at sea? Yeah, um, a lot of times feeding on plankton, feeding on fish. Um, it's hard for them to actually um, handle fish while they're on the water. Um, and so that's why with their webbed feet, um, they're either pecking at something and trying to, um, you know, holding their crop whatever they could until they get back to land but it's usually feeding on on small feeder fish or bait fish that's really cool um 
Emily was curious when they are doing their tap dancing, um, are they trying to mimic rain? I mean, do you think that that's one of their things that they're doing? That, I've heard that explanation. It sounds like raindrops. Um, I equate it to, you know, how a birders pish, we psh, 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 and we get all these birds to come out and figure out what, you know, what, what's, what's going on here. And I think that's what's happening to whatever's in the soil. They, they come up uh, because of the noise, because of the vibrations. And uh, it could be trying to mimic rain for sure. Yeah. All right. So um, Laura had a question. She said, um, where, where exactly do the Franklin's gulls breed? And I, I don't know if it was North or South Dakota, but she's actually looking for the name of the lake, if you know it. Do you know uh, that? In South Dakota, outside of Pierre, South Dakota, it's called Sand Lake sand lake um, and they're just absolutely stunning in may if you get there in july they start to molt and uh, they look kind of bedraggled and worn and faded the best month i would say is may early june uh, sand lake they they take on the pink under parts the pink head and the hood uh, gorgeous birds they're also known as the prairie dove the prairie dove Nice. Um, Dana asked, um, are the goals serving a good purpose when they're cleaning out our landfills? Like, I mean, is that, is, is that their job? Are they serving that purpose? Yeah, I've asked that at the landfills. I've asked, you know, if, if um, they're taking some of this stuff out of the landfill, aren't they in some ways helping uh, not fill the land here? Uh, and the answer I get is, well, this, you know, it has to go out somewhere. And if they're depositing this into the waters, the local waterways, then that could be a problem. Um, so yeah, are they are they doing more harm than good? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and kind of to follow up with that, um, yeah, eagles are often sickened by what they eat in landfills. Are gulls susceptible to getting ill? Yeah, so there's several studies right now, graduate students who are trying to answer this question. We find a lot of aberrations in gulls, probably more than any other bird group. Um, gulls that have different colored eyes, gulls that have a lot of plumage issues, color issues, um, just deformities like nobody's business. And it seems to be more common in gulls, definitely more than their closest relatives, the terns. And the terns don't feed in landfills. They don't take handouts from homo sapiens. So, um, is there a correlation between landfill uh, feeding and, and aberrations and deformities? I bet there is. Uh, I can't imagine the amount of biotoxins that they're exposed to. I've seen gulls um, feeding around paint thinner. I've seen them picking through full diapers. Um, they eat first and they ask questions later and I'm sure it's gotten um, a lot of them in trouble. All right, so um, I got a question here. Are gulls food for humans? Like do any, I guess humans eat gulls. Uh, so uh, historically the Vikings used to eat gulls. Um, there's lots of people who still eat gull eggs. Do you guys have time for a video? <laughs> um, but it, eggs are being harvested um, by the Inuits, um, by the Huna people in Alaska. Um, they do this. They do this through permits and, of course, uh, government regulations. Um, but they take lots of gull eggs. I don't know of anybody who eats gulls modern day, like 2021, eating gulls. But they do take and harvest gull eggs, mainly glaucous wing, herring gull eggs. All right, got a, another couple questions here. Um, so. Why are they trying to remove the colony? Marley asked, why are they trying to remove the colonies from the landfills and the rooftops? Um, yeah, um, mainly because they're, they're a nuisance, lots of droppings, but on rooftops, um, you know, there's folks who come out and say, if, if you have this colony of birds on your rooftop, it's going to cut the rooftops uh, life in half. So this roof, should have lasted 25 years. Now it's only going to last, say, 12, 15 years. Um, they clog up downspouts and gutters with their nesting material. So they do present some problems. They're an annoyance more than anything. Uh, their droppings, I think, are an annoyance more than anything. Uh, you guys have probably heard of Barry Bonds. Who remembers Barry Bonds? Barry Bonds out in California and Seaside. 
um, has this big building where he houses like 30 of his cars, very nice cars. And uh, the Heerman's gulls actually took up on the roof of this building and uh, he removed them. He had them removed and he put netting up and uh, the birders were outraged by it because it's the only Heerman's gull colony that we had in California. Um, but there's conservation efforts right now to have them uh, relocated on a man-made island in Seaside, California. Um, I think more than anything, people are just annoyed by their noise in the summer. They're very, very loud. Uh, their droppings are an annoyance. And, and like I said, the, the gutters and downspouts being clogged is another reason. I think that kind of piggybacked because uh, Kathleen did have a question is, you know, why do people not want gulls around? But I, you may have just answered a lot of <laughs> that with the same with the rooftops. Yeah. Um, parking lots is another story. I mean, I don't, I don't see why anybody would remove gulls from parking lots, but I see people speed up, like intentionally go through the gull flock. Um, I think part of it is for amusement, just to kind of see that, yeah, they have wings and they know how to fly away. Um, but maybe you're guilty of this. Maybe you've run through a gull flock before or let the kids do it. Um, it's kind of fun to do, um, but when you do it with a motor vehicle, um, I think that's a different story. Awesome. Well, I think I got to everyone's questions. If I, oh, uh, oh, like we're, we're got a website we're sharing. We're sharing um, Amar's um, blog page right now in the chat, if you haven't been there. Um, I think I got to everyone's questions. If I didn't ask your question, oh, oh, wait, we got one right here. Do gulls carry, uh oh, hold on, hold on. Let me look here. Do gulls carry diseases that can be transmitted to humans? Um, so here in Chicago, our beaches are sometimes closed in the summer because, uh, well, they blame it on the gulls. They say there's high E. coli counts. Uh, the E. coli counts can be dangerous for people swimming. And so uh, that's the only one I know about where beaches are closed because of uh, gull droppings. Um, there's ornithologist friends of mine who work at the Field Museum here in Chicago who have refuted that and have said uh, that's nonsense. It's, it can't be. Um, the gulls that are causing these sort of concentrations of E. coli. Um, but that's, that's the, the number one um, that I would know um, when somebody asked, aren't they sort of helping by removing some of this waste from landfills? And I said, well, the droppings have to go somewhere, especially if they go to a smaller lake um, um, near uh, maybe water filtration plants, this could be a problem. Awesome, we've got one more question here. Um, the gulls that do a Western track to Peru, is it known if an individual bird always takes the same track? Yeah, um, so that same male that went down to uh, Peru slash Chile, um, that male the following year went through the same migratory pathway. Um, but these geo trackers are only good for about four years. And um, I guess, um, the, the study ended actually after two years, um, but it would have been nice to see if it did it a couple more times. We know it did it two years uh, consecutively. Awesome, great. Well, I think I think I got everybody's questions. I'm looking here in the chat and um, yeah, everyone enjoying it. So you, can you see the chat too, Amar? I can, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm really enjoying the comments here, so thank you. <laughs> Oh, gulls are even more intelligent than they gave them credit for. There you go. <laughs> You're doing your job. <laughs> well, Amar, we really appreciate you coming to us in, in our rooms. We didn't even have to come to a building to see you. You came to, into our uh, homes and saw us. So <laughs> I think this will be the new way we do a lot of presentations. Um, it, it's going to be eco-friendly. Yeah, that's true. It's eco-friendly. You know, we didn't have to <laughs> burn any any fossil fuels to get here. Well, um, I want to thank you, Amar, again for um, spending your time with us this evening. And I'm so excited about your Gull ID talk tomorrow. That's going to oh, really yeah. get into things. I think a lot of these same people may be there. So we will be excited yeah. to see you again then. But um, thank um, you. Get a good night's rest if you're coming to the Gull ID talk tomorrow. Come with a clear <laughs> head. Um, come ready to uh, learn some stuff about your gulls. Awesome, great. Um, yes, as someone's asking me, can you tell us how to watch this later? Well, Dana, 
crossing our fingers if we did this right we're going to be able to send you a link to a youtube <laughs> Um, that is our goal. We've been practicing. So um, what I'll do, Dana, is I will send an email out once that link is ready to everyone that was registered using the same email that um, I sent you the original link in, and we'll go from there. So um, we appreciate that. So thank you, everyone, um, for coming to our festival keynote tonight. Um, if you're going on any of the activities tomorrow, enjoy, because Sunday's weather's not looking great. Um, and But it'll be nice, perfect weather tomorrow afternoon in your living rooms at 4 p.m. for the golf talk. <laughs> so um, thanks again, Amar, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye, everyone.